Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. Displayed are the list of news articles selected for today's analysis and their page numbers in Chennai, Delhi, Bengaluru and Thiruvananthapuram editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes and the time stamping of the news articles are provided in the description box and for the benefit of mobile phone viewers, the time stamping is also provided in the comment section. Now let us move on to the first news article. This editorial article discusses about the qualifications for leader of opposition in the present political scenario in our country. Now this analysis will be helpful in prelim syllabus under current events of national importance and in political system under Indian polity. It will be helpful in mains preparation in GS paper 2 under parliament, structure, functioning, powers and privileges and issues arising out of the. Now if you see in the present Lok Sabha, that is the 17th Lok Sabha, the present strength of the second largest party is 52. Now the second largest party in the present Lok Sabha is Congress, Indian National Congress. It has 52 members. So we are not sure if the leader of opposition will be declared in the newly elected Lok Sabha, that is the house of the people. So we will see some of the issues surrounding this matter. The author tells that as soon as the new Lok Sabha speaker will be elected, there will be a question of formal recognition with respect to opposition party and also leader of opposition. According to the salary and allowances of leaders of opposition in Parliament Act of 1977, this act recognizes and provides the same official status, allowances and perks that are admissible to cabinet ministers to the leader of opposition in both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. But in the case of Lok Sabha, the recognition of the opposition party and the leader of opposition has to be done by the speaker of Lok Sabha. Now in the 16th Lok Sabha, that is 2014 to 2019, so that is the previous Lok Sabha, the largest party in the opposition was Indian National Congress. It won 44 seats in Lok Sabha at that time. Now after careful consideration, it was decided not to recognize the party's leader as leader of opposition. We will see the reason in this discussion. Now the author tells that the matter needs to be revisited in the context of 17th Lok Sabha, that is the newly constituted Lok Sabha. Because for a long period, a democracy cannot be run without leader of opposition. Next, the author has discussed the need for an opposition in Lok Sabha. He tells that India needs a stable government and a strong leader who is capable of taking firm decisions. And these decisions should be taken within the rule of law. Also, the decisions have to ensure security, development and good governance within the rule of law. Now we could see a ruling alliance in central government and that has a remarkable majority in Lok Sabha. However, for the success and survival of a democracy, see in our country, the author tells that an effective opposition is also required in addition to the stable government. He tells that if, if no opposition exists, then an opposition may have to be created. Also, if there is no opposition from outside, that is from other political parties other than majority ruling party, the author tells there is every danger that an opposition may grow within the majority political party. Therefore, in order to provide necessary checks and balances to the ruling majority government, the role of opposition party and the leader of opposition is very essential for a democracy to function. Now let us see the timeline of the leaders of opposition mentioned by the author in this editorial. Now, Historically, the first officially designated opposition party in parliament emerged from the breakup of the Congress party, that is Indian National Congress. First time after the independence of a country, the Indian National Congress split in 1969. Ms. Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister at that time. If you see, the Congress split to form the Indian National Congress Requisitionist and Indian National Congress Organization. The leader of INC organization, Mr. Ram Shubhak Singh, became the first person to be formally recognized as LOP or leader of opposition in the 4th Lok Sabha. Now, the period of 4th Lok Sabha is from 1967 to 1970. Now, if you take the 6th Lok Sabha, that is from 1977 to 1979, the Indian National Congress was the opposition. Now within this three year period of 1977 to 79, the Lok Sabha saw three different leaders of opposition. The author tells that there were splits in the Congress also in Janata Party in the same period. 
so mr ashwant rao b chavan mr c m stephen and mr jagjeevan ram were successive leaders of opposition in the 6th lok sabha now you note that till 1977 there were no emoluments and perks attached to the position or the designation of lop so here the author means to tell that it was merely a post but if you see we note that there is no provision in the constitution of india or even in the lok sabha rules of procedure about the recognition of the leader of opposition now the author tells until the year 1977 there were no emoluments and perks now this is because in the year 1977 a legislation was enacted to provide emoluments and perks to the designation of lop now right from the first lok sabha that is from the year 1952 the practice is that if the second largest party in lok sabha has a strength of 1/10 of the total membership of the house then the leader of that party can be recognized as the leader of opposition now know that as per the constitution of india the lok sabha should consist of not more than 530 members from the states and not more than 20 members from the union territories these are mentioned in article 81 of indian constitution also not more than two members of the anglo indian community who can be nominated by the president the president can nominate if he is of the opinion if he or she is of the opinion that the anglo indian community is not adequately enoughly represented in the lok sabha now this is as per article 331 of indian constitution so totally if you see lok sabha can have 530 plus 20 plus 2 which is equal to 552 members but know that currently lok sabha has only 545 seats where 543 seats are filled by direct elections and two seats are reserved for the anglo indian community who are to be nominated by the president now in order to recognize a party as a largest opposition party the party should have the numbers that is enough to constitute the quorum for the sitting of lok sabha now this means the largest opposition party should have at least 1/10th of the strength of lok sabha now this is because article 100 class 3 of indian constitution states that the quorum to constitute a meeting of either house of parliament shall be 1/10 of the total number of members of the house if you calculate that for lok sabha it will come to 55 now note that the constitution of india talks only about the quorum but not about the numbers required for recognizing the leader of opposition now the idea is that the second largest party should have the capacity to constitute the quorum now what is this quorum this quorum according to article 100 class 3 means 1/10 of the total membership of the house of the people the author tells that from 9th lok sabha to 15th lok sabha that is from 1989 to 2014 there was a minimum strength of 55 members for second largest parties so the speakers of those lok sabhas has duly recognized the opposition parties and leaders of opposition if you see in 9th lok sabha mr rajiv gandhi from indian national congress was the leader of opposition and then in 10th lok sabha mr l k adwani and then uh, mr atal bihari vajpay from bjp were the leaders of opposition successively then the 11th lok sabha had mr p v narsimha rao from indian national congress and mr atal bihari vajpay from bjp as leader of opposition successively then mr sharad pawar and ms sonia gandhi from indian national congress were the leaders of opposition in 12th and 13th lok sabha respectively that is for 12th lok sabha mr sharad pawar and 13th lok sabha ms sonia gandhi and then mr lk adwani and ms sushma swaraj from bjp were leaders of opposition in 14th lok sabha and 15th lok sabha respectively now you may keep a tag on these names and time periods because sometimes one or two questions or one or two statements given in the questions in prelims exam can be based on these so it will be easy for you to correlate if you you know somehow have in mind these timelines and names for example in last year there was a statement uh, in question that the statement was in the first lok sabha the single largest party in the opposition was swatantra party and if you see the question paper this year there was a question like ninth schedule was introduced in constitution of india during the prime ministership of which prime minister the name which the name of the prime minister so some questions do come like this so you we may be you know based on current affairs we can keep a tab on all these names and timelines 
Now let's see about the legislation that was introduced or enacted in 1977 called as Salary and Allowances of Leaders of Opposition in Parliament Act 1977. Now this act defines leader of opposition in section 2. It states that the leader of opposition means that member of the house who is the leader in that house of the party which is in opposition to the government. Simply it says leader of opposition is the member of for example if it is Lok Sabha it's the member of Lok Sabha who is the leader of the opposition party but there is one condition this opposition party should have the greatest numerical strength and also have to be recognized by the chairman of the house in case of Rajya Sabha and recognition is by speaker in case it is house of the people or Lok Sabha so this definition has two conditions one the second largest party you know should have the greatest numerical strength and also for Lok Sabha it has to be recognized by the speaker so from this act we understand that the leader of opposition is based on speakers recognition and also based on greatest numerical strength but the act has not mentioned clearly or it has not mentioned on what exactly is the numerical strength that is required now let us come to one another book called as Directions in Lok Sabha. This book is nothing but the directions by the speaker of Lok Sabha for the conduct of Lok Sabha. Here according to direction 121C of 9th edition of this directions, it has laid down some condition for recognition of parliamentary party or parliamentary group. One such condition is having at least a strength that is equal to the quorum fixed to constitute a sitting of the house that is one tenth of the total number of members of the house. Now this direction 121C actually linked article 100 class 3 of Indian constitution having the practice of recognizing leader of opposition based on whether the party has the capacity to constitute a quorum of the house. Also according to section 2 b of leaders and chief whips of recognized parties and groups in parliament facilities act recognized party in Lok Sabha means a party that has not less than 55 members so from the directions and this legislation that we saw the author tells that one tenth of the total seats which is 55 seats in the case of Lok Sabha is the minimum number of seats for recognizing a party now this legislation, uh, the leaders and chief whips of recognized parties and groups in parliament act talks about party, it did not mention clearly about leader of opposition or the opposition party. So as per this, the previous Lok Sabha that is the 16th Lok Sabha from 2014 to 2019, it did not have a recognized opposition party or a recognized leader of opposition. Now this was because the Indian National Congress which was the second largest party in the last Lok Sabha it had only 44 seats which was 11 shorter than or 11 lesser than the required magical number 55. Now even in the present Lok Sabha the 17th Lok Sabha the newly elected Lok Sabha the second largest party is Indian National Congress but it is short of three numbers that is it now has only 52 seats. But what is the requirement? Requirement is 55. So it is short of three members to maintain the quorum. So the author suggests that the newly elected speaker of Lok Sabha after the election within the Lok Sabha should relax this direction 121C of Lok Sabha and recognize a leader of opposition for the sake of effective opposition in a democracy. So we saw that there is no constitutional provision regarding the numbers required for leader of opposition. Also, the 1977 law does not provide for requirement of 55 members, a particular number as an essential prerequisite. We saw that the 1977 law talks only about two conditions. It talks about greatest numerical strength. It didn't mention what is that strength. And it mentions that it has to be recognized by the speaker. So we can see that it is up to the discretion of the speaker. So everything regarding the leader of opposition depends on speaker's directions and discretion. So the author hopes that a rightful direction will be taken or it has to be taken in this regard. Now the author suggests one possible way that is to amend and thereby substitute the word party by pre-poll alliance or substitute the word party by party or pre-poll alliance in section 2 of the salary and allowances of leaders of opposition in parliament act of 1977. 
Now, the reason that the author gives to include or substitute the term party with pre-poll alliance or to include pre-poll alliance is because pre-poll alliance have now become almost a part of Indian polity. Now, also, we see many instances when the president and governors decide on whom to call first for forming the government in case when there is no party securing a clear majority in the house these pre-poll alliances are considered as a credible and legitimate by the presidents and governors president with respect to central government governors with respect to state government now this pre-poll alliance is nothing but an alliance of two or more parties which form a group before the elections and if the pre-poll alliance is recognized as an opposition party and if the leader of the alliance becomes leader of opposition then this has one implication this may have a tremendous potential for the growth of a strong or a sound two party or three party alliance system now he tells that such a kind of alliance system could end the present system wherein we see you know more than 2000 parties registered with the election commission but find only few major political parties winning the elections in addition to discussing about uh, leader of opposition the author also talks about two other things which may be provided whenever a comprehensive law is enacted for the political parties one is about providing the candidates of one alliance a common symbol and the other is only national alliances can contest for Lok Sabha with a agreed common minimum program here you keep in mind the author suggests not national parties he suggests that national alliances shall contest for Lok Sabha with a agreed common minimum program the author finally concludes that a separate in-depth analysis consideration and debate must happen in all these aspects simply we can say that the author stresses two main points in this editorial one is the definite requirement of leader of opposition of this 17th Lok Sabha for the democracy to function better and the second is the recognition of pre-poll alliance to settle the matter related to leader of opposition for having a meaningful democratic political system in our country. With this, let's move on to next news article. This news article is about black soft shell turtle. Now in the newspaper, you can also find about Indian roof turtle and Indian tur turtle as well. Indian tent turtle as well which we will discuss in some other days when the news related to these turtles come today's discussion we will discuss about black soft shell turtle this discussion will be relevant in prelim syllabus under current events of national importance then in general issues on biodiversity the discussion can also be linked to main syllabus in gs paper 3 under the area conservation the news is that the hatchlings of the rare black soft shell turtles were bid adieu by the temple in Guwahati. Now hatchling is nothing but a young animal that has recently emerged or came out of its egg. Now bid adieu is the French word which means goodbye. So in short the news is that a temple in Guwahati has said goodbye to the newborn turtle babies of black soft shell turtle. Now this is because the turtle was earlier a part of Guwahati temple for a long time and they see the turtles as a pride of the temple and now its hatchlings are being shifted to a zoo for a greater cause. Now the greater cause is reintroducing the species into the wild. The temple even organized a special ceremony. Now the ceremony was to welcome and to say goodbye to the hatchlings. Now the welcome was because eggs of black soft shell turtles were collected from these temple ponds and were transferred to the Assam State Zoo for incubation and after birth Assam State Zoo they were brought back to the temple ponds that's why they use the word welcome now after welcoming now they are saying goodbye now this goodbye was because these hatchlings will be reintroduced into the wild and they will never return back to the temple now why is this news you know important for us to discuss see this black soft cell turtle is extinct in the wild according to IUCN in India very few are found in the state of Assam and these few remain these few that remain are found in the ponds of some temples in Assam as though the turtle was extinct in the wild but now the new babies have been born and this was possible because of a non-governmental organization called as help earth now the NGO started a conservation program for the turtles this was done by involving the temples and the NGO collected the eggs of the turtles in December last year 
and they were able to take some 70 eggs and 34 eggs hatched in the zoo. Now let's see some facts related to this black soft shell turtle. See its scientific name is Nisonia nigricans. It is also known as Bostami soft shell turtle. Freshwater turtle and prefers living in lakes, rivers and tributaries. Simply freshwater. This species was long considered to be one of the rarest turtles in the world and it was thought to be extinct in the wild. And it was known only from a single population of about 150 animals at an artificial pond at the Bostami Shrine in Chittagong city of Bangladesh. Now this is the reason why they also call this turtle as Bostami soft shell turtle. In Bangladesh and also at the international level it is also called as holy turtle of Bangladesh. So this turtle is a sacred symbol to the people. Now this is due to the uh, apparent rareness and a tale surrounding the myth that the Muslim saint Bostami turned the evil spirits into turtles when he founded the Bostami shrine. Well that is the myth. But now the species was confirmed in few natural localities in Brahmaputra river drainage of northeastern state of Assam in India. It was rediscovered in Brahmaputra river at Kasiranga and Nameri national parks of Assam. And also subsequent surveys in adjoining areas of Kasiranga confirmed the presence of the species. Its presence was also confirmed at a small number of Indian Buddhist temple ponds as well. Now they say that uh, the oldest individual in these species are around 150 years old. Now we could find turtles and tortoises living for a long period and these turtles face severe threats of habitat destruction and over exploitation for human consumption. Now we saw that the black soft shell turtle is extinct in the wild. Now this is because it was listed under extinct in the wild category of IUCN red list. Now there are uh, some, some conservationalists who also say these are not actually extinct in the wild. They can be found in some natural habitats as well. There is a debate going on. Now let us discuss what is meant by extinct in the wild. Now when we say a particular species is extinct in the wild, it means it survives only in captivity. Now here captivity means only in regions other than the natural range of a the natural habitat of a particular animal and a species may be listed as extinct in the wild only after years of surveys when they are unable to record even one individual in its natural habitat or native habitat now with respect to protection national level it is protected under schedule 4 of wildlife protection act of 1972 and it is also listed in appendix 1 of sites convention and it is also included in world's most endangered tortoises and freshwater turtles of 2011 under the category high risk of extinction list. So this is the importance with respect to black soft shell freshwater turtle. The displayed practice question will be discussed in the last session. Now let us move on to next news article. Now the next news article is about uh, about the finding that around uh, that the drugs from 18 pharmaceutical companies were found as substandard quality and one of these 18 pharmaceutical company is a public sector undertaking or a government owned corporation. Now this article will be relevant in prelim syllabus under current events of national importance and in terms of main syllabus it comes under in GS paper 2 it comes under welfare schemes for the vulnerable sections of the population by the by the central and state governments. Now the one public sector undertaking that is whose drugs are also found as uh, not of standard quality is Indian Drugs and Pharmaceutical Limited that comes under Department of Pharmaceutical Government of India. Now this was found out by Bureau of Pharma PSUs of India. Now they have also blacklisted some seven companies for two years. Now public sector undertaking means these are government owned corporations in which majority of the paid up share capital is held by central government or the majority of paid up share capital is held by state government 
or the majority of paid up share capital is held partly by central government partly by one or more state governments when we say majority it means 51% or more of the paid up share capital now the new states that the generic drugs of these companies are not of standard quality now according to united states food and drug administration a generic drug is an equal substitute for its brand name counterpart it will be same in the aspects of dosage safety strength and quality and performance and also the use with respect to a similar drug that comes with the brand now the purpose of generic drug is to make the drug affordable to all masses because a branded drug will be of high cost the generic drug will be have the same quality as a branded drug now this bureau of bureau of pharma psus of india was established in 2008 under departments of pharmaceuticals of ministry of chemicals and fertilizers it is also an implementing agency of pradhan mantri jan aushadi pariyojana now it aims to bring down the personal healthcare budget of every citizen of india by providing quality generic medicines at affordable prices like bppi the pradhan mantri bharatiya jan aushadi pariyojana was also established in 2008 under ministry of chemicals and fertilizers government of india now we, we also saw that implementing agency of this program is bureau of pharma psus of india now even the vision of pm bjp is also same as bppi to bring down the healthcare expenses of every indian citizen now along with the help of other central public sector units this bppa coordinates the procurement supply marketing of generic drugs through the jan aushadi kendras under the scheme now jan aushadi kendras are also called as jan aushadi stores now the coverage area with respect to the scheme is that it includes all the districts in the country generally the product basket covers medicines surgicals consumables stents and replacements a surgical means supplies used for medical operations like surgical instruments gloves etc a stent means a tube placed into a hollow structure inside the body and the structure can be an artery a vein etc and these stents are used to hold these structures open now regarding the supply chain see it includes bppi sourcing the medicines from suppliers then storing it under central warehouse facility from where it will be given to distributors who sends them to jan aushadi kendras these kendras sell medicines and surgical items along with other medical products as well these jan aushadi kendras are located within government hospital premises also found in private hospital premises and other places as well now jan means people aushadi means medicine so this program can be easily understood as prime minister's program or the prime minister's project for medicine for all and with this we come to the end of this article discussion the displayed practice prelims question will be discussed in the last session now this article talks about the need for a legislation at the central level for public procurement and also it talks about the concerns expressed by the supreme court about uh, writ proceedings and appeals that are coming at supreme court with respect to award of tenders at national level and also at state level and uh, such an issue being carried out routinely in supreme court now this article is relevant in your prelim syllabus in current events of national and international importance and in public policy in indian polity and governance and in main syllabus in gs paper 2 it could come under government policies and interventions in various sectors and issues arising out of the design and implementation now here public procurement means purchase of goods and services by the public sector and it is a very key economic activity of uh, government because it accounts for almost 30% of gross domestic product in our country the author says that uh, the supreme court observations that it has become a matter of routine of writ proceedings in supreme court with respect to award of tenders now the supreme court has not considered these are the result of challenges due to inadequacies in our national public procurement laws 
see the existing constitutional provisions are also inadequate now one such article that deals with public spending or public procurement we can relate it to public procurement is article 282 of indian constitution because it talks about financial autonomy in public spending according to author but even this article does not have any provision related to the issue of guidance on public procurement principles public procurement policies procedures and also it does not have anything to deal with grievance redress and if you come to the level of state governments there is also insufficiency if you observe the state public procurement or the public procurement at the state level is regulated by legislations only in five states and these states are tamil nadu karnataka rajasthan andhra pradesh and assam now this means that more than 20 states in india do not have a legislation at the state level to regulate public procurement now the author says even the states that have the state level legislations they are not effective and they fall short of prescription set out by the supreme court in one of the case law called as madras bar association versus union of india see the court has stated in this case law grievance redressal mechanisms should possess the characteristics that makes them an effective efficacious alternative remedy now we'll see some of the initiatives taken by governments you know to address the concerns first let's see the public procurement bill see this this bill had provisions to regulate public procurement with an objective of ensuring transparency accountability and probity in procurement process now we have seen various instances of uh, charges of corruption in public procurement and even it have toppled several elected governments so the public procurement bill had provision of ensuring transparency and accountability and thereby tackling the corruption with respect to public procurement the next one is public procurement bill of 2015 now one important thing that both these bills did not were not passed into a legislation so these were initiatives without any positive result but the both the above versions of bill had provisions of robust internal mechanism for grievance redressal in public procurement but then they didn't result into a promising legislation because it was not passed by parliament and received the assent of the president now some of the suggestions very important suggestion is that there is a urgent requirement for a law and also grievance redressal mechanism in the law and this law has to be enacted in central level and also at state level and in all the states and even in state level with respect to those five states where we find ineffectiveness this ineffectiveness has to be addressed the author talks about article 282 of indian constitution and states that it does not contain some provisions relating to the policies and principles and procedures relating to public procurement and also about grievance redressal. Therefore, the author could be indirectly suggesting if at all a constitutional amendment is going to take place, maybe in Article 282, which is related to public procurement, there should be provisions, there should be inclusion of provisions with respect to principles, policies, procedures and grievance redressal framework of public procurement. And finally, the author concludes that Till these issues of inadequacies in our national procurement laws are not addressed, till then the constitutional courts, that is the high courts and supreme court has to hear the appeals for the time being. So with this we come to the end of this discussion with respect to the editorial article on public procurement. Now let us move on to next news article. Now this editorial article is about Shanghai Cooperation Organization and its recent summit that took that took place in uh, the capital of Kyrgyzstan. The author tells that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is becoming important to India's Eurasia policy. Now, particularly after the recent swearing-in ceremony of the new top leadership in Indian government, we have been seeing about India's foreign policy with respect to neighborhood, and now we are discussing with respect to Eurasia. Now, coming to this Shanghai Cooperation Organization, see the members include Russia, China and Central Asian countries of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Before two years, that is in 2017, India and Pakistan became its members. Now what you have to keep in mind here is one of the Central Asian countries 
Turkmenistan is not a member country in this Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And India's neighbor Afghanistan is also not a member country in Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but it is an observer. And this Shanghai Cooperation Organization now has become an important forum for India's Eurasian neighborhood. When we say Eurasia, it means Europe and Asia. It largely includes the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. This organization is by and large led by China and Russia. Now recently, SEO held a heads of state summit at Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyz Republic. The major themes that were discussed in this summit are the terrorism, regional cooperation and also about the future of Afghanistan. Now, according to the author, this uh, membership of India in SCO will give it a chance to counter some of the other groupings in which it is a part. This membership will also help India in continuing its multi-alignment strategy. Here, multi-alignment means aligning with various blocks or parties to a rivalry or for influence. Now, you take an example. We know that United States and Russia are two opposite blocks. But India aligns with both United States and also with Russia and case to case basis. Now there are many such blocks, but India engages with various blocks at the same time. So this policy or this strategy is called as multi alignment strategy. Arthur tells that now SEO is also a platform for alignment on issues with respect to energy security, connectivity with respect to Eurasia and also trade. So now we know that uh, India is not actively engaging or considering South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, that is SARC. But India and Pakistan are member countries of SEO and Afghanistan is an observer in SEO. So author tells that as of now, with respect to the present engagement, SEO provides the only multilateral platform for India to deal in close proximity with Pakistan and Afghanistan. Now, uh, even in the sidelines of this SEO summit, we could not see any bilateral meeting between India and Pakistan. Although we saw bilateral talks between India and China and India and Russia. Now, some of the commitments of some member nations with respect to SEO, see India and Pakistan are committed to engage at several other levels. One such level is with respect to the regional anti-terrorist terrorism structure, that is RATS. SEO rats and then all the SEO countries have committed to strengthen economic cooperation and supporting the WTO structure at the same time building people to people ties tourism and cultural bonds within the member countries of the SEO grouping and another important thing with respect to Afghanistan peace process the Bishkek declaration it stressed that there should be an inclusive peace process but that should be led by Afghans themselves now this means Afghanistan will take care of its own peace process and the other member nations of SEO will not involve in its peace process or it will other member nations of SEO will not take a lead in the peace process of Afghanistan. Now then all the member nations of SEO except India have praised or applauded the China's Belt and Road Initiative. Now India has not joined this BRI initiative of China. And one of the main reason is that because a part of this Belt and Road Initiative, that is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, passes through the Indian territory of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, which is a disputed territory between India and Pakistan. And that is one of the main reasons why India opposes the Belt and Road Initiative of China. And China also so far has not uh, accommodated the Indian concerns with respect to China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and the path in which it travels. So these are some of the information with respect to SEO discussed by the author in this editorial. Now the article also talks about the Indian Prime Minister meeting the United States President on the sidelines of upcoming G20 summit in Osaka, Japan. And the author thinks that many issues will be discussed between the two leaders, particularly the ongoing uh, India-US trade issues and the plans related to military cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region and also about the demands of United States to curb the defense deals or not to purchase S-400 anti-missile system from Russia and US may also try to push India to deny the access to Chinese telecom major Hawaii 
to India's 5G technology network bids. So overall, at the end of the day, see this article tells that this SEO summit and the bilateral meetings that India had in Bishkek, be it with China or Russia, reveals the direction of India's foreign policy with respect to Eurasian region. And he also tells that India's strategy of balancing the competing interests of various emerging blocs will also be tested in the months ahead. Now on June 11, we have discussed an editorial with respect to the challenges of Indian foreign policy five years and later. And on that editorial, we have discussed how India is going to balance relationships with respect to various countries, keeping in mind the rise of China. Now you could uh, align these, uh, this article discussion also with that article. Link of the article discussion of uh, that article on June 11 is also given in the description. With this, we come to the end of this article discussion. We are in our last session, the practice question discussion session. Now the first question is with respect to black soft shell turtle. Now they have given three statements and are asking which among the above statements are not correct. The first statement, it is a sea turtle and is endemic to India. Now if you recall our discussion, the news was about the turtle hatchlings of a temple and they were in the pond of that particular temple. If it can be found in a pond, it means it is a freshwater turtle. So this makes this statement as a wrong statement because black soft shell turtle is a freshwater turtle. And with respect to the second part of the first statement, there are still debates going on whether it is endemic only to India or only to Bangladesh or to both. So overall, the first statement is not correct. So anyway, the answer should contain first statement. So if you see options B and C, it doesn't contain op the first statement. So we can eliminate B and C. Now let's come to second statement. The second statement states, it is listed as extinct by IUCN red list of threatened species. Now this is wrong because the turtle is listed as extinct in the wild by IUCN. Now extinct and extinct in the wild are different. When we say a species is extinct in the wild, it means the particular species only survives in captivity. That means it survives or it is being conserved in a place other than its natural habitat other than its established natural range. Therefore, the second statement is incorrect because it is extinct in the wild. Now, the third statement, and when we say extinct, it means without any reasonable doubt, the last individual of a particular species has died in the world. So that is the difference between extinct and extinct in the wild. Now, the third statement, it is not protected by the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Now this statement is wrong because we saw it is protected under Schedule 4 of Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. So all the statements are not correct. Therefore the correct answer for this question is option D, 1, 2, 3 are not correct. Now the second question is with respect to Pradhan Mantri Jan Naushadi Pariyojana. Again they have given three statements and are asking which of the statements are correct. First it aims to bring down the healthcare budget of every citizen of India. Now this statement is correct and it was established in the year 2008 to bring down the personal health care budget of every Indian citizen. And the second statement, it functions under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Now this statement is appears to be correct because it deals with health, it deals with medicine, right? It deals with health care budget. But the second option is incorrect because it functions under Department of Pharmaceuticals which functions under Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. So the second statement is wrong. So when we say second statement is wrong, option A, option D are eliminated. Now the third statement, they say the implementing agency is Bureau of Pharma PSUs of India. Now this is correct. Even BPPI is also established in the year 2008. So the correct and we find that uh, statements 1 and statement 3 are correct. Therefore the correct answer is option C, 1 and 3 only. Now the third question. Which of the following countries are members of both SARC and SCO? Now SARC means South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. SCO means Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now they have given four nations and are asking to choose the correct answer from the options given. Now see India is a SARC country and India is also part of SCO. Same is the case of Pakistan. Pakistan is in SARC and also in SCO. And Afghanistan is part of SARC, yes. But is it part of Shanghai Cooperation Organization? Yes, it is part of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. 
but is it a member or an observer it is not a member it is just an observer and therefore three should not be there so afghanistan is not a member in both these organization now coming to china china is not a member of sarc but a member of seo so only india and pakistan of the given options are both are members of both sarc and seo so the answer for this question is option a 1 and 2 only with this we come to the end of today's the hindu news analysis if you like the video press the like button comment share and subscribe to shankar ais academy youtube channel for daily updates